I want to bring in Leo Hendry now, our special guest. He's a managing director at Intermedia Partners. Knows a thing or two about bringing companies public and, and what it means to please shareholders when you are running a public company. Uh, Leo, you know, the fact that these IPOs, you know, half of them have, have been so poor, they're below their offer right. price. Uh, what does it take right now to have a, to, you know, what does it take right now to have a good, you know, to have an IPO become a success? You know, I think there's been a fundamental rule that's been forgotten, and, and I'd actually like to go back to the prior segment where your colleague talked about RIM today and, you, and Netflix, and yes. then you followed up. I mean, these stocks were right up here, and now they're crashing. And, and the, the rule that can't be avoided is barrier to competition. Mm. And when there's a barrier to competition, all of these media and tech-related stocks, they, they, they take off and they do very well. And the market is realizing that the, the, these newer entrepreneurs, uh, they're so new, they're so young, they're so vibrant, but they forgot sort of how do you make money in media. And, and there's a massive distinction between operating income and building equity value. A lot of things for short periods of time can make a lot of money. Remember on a prior show, you and I talked about Netflix. Right. And I, it was right after Reed Hastings had been here. and. Uh, I said that I wasn't as, I, I liked the company, but I wasn't optimistic about its, its medium term value because I thought that others would come into the space. And that's what you're seeing in Netflix. But in RIM, RIM had the, the PDA market entirely to itself. Mm -hmm. Now it doesn't. So barriers to competition in media are a sine qua non. And, and you take these, these roughly 200 plus uh, IPOs that are sort of sitting on the shelves. If you're really honest about them, what do they do that I can't do as well? Uh, a Groupon, uh, a LinkedIn, a Zynga. Right. I mean, they're, they're interesting concepts, and these are interesting young people. But do you honestly think that Google can't build its own Groupon the day it, someday when it wants to? Or but, but Leo, but competition is not a foreign concept to any industry, though. I mean, there is. It's, it's not a foreign concept except in evaluation arena. And so okay. you and I have in the past talked about the, the broadcast networks. Mm -hmm. Well, they, they trade at very low values. They, when, when Comcast recently bought NBC, they ascribed a relatively higher value to the Golf Channel than they did to NBC, the network, mm. because golf owns its audience. And, and when, when John Same Malone point. and I were running TCI and Liberty, uh, we sold TCI to AT&T for something like 24 times forward cash flow. The, Comcast, a wonderfully run cable company, many of these uh, systems we had are their systems. Right. In a relative basis, they're trading at about five times cash flow. And it's not because they're managing it poorly. They're, it's because of the satellite and phone and, and, the competition, and, and your right. children who come sort of what's called over the top. Right. So it's this competitive environment. Hey, so media is, is a peculiar animal. Uh, Dom, I know you want to jump in here. Yeah, Leo, Betty, one of the things that my old boss, Neil Hennessy, used to talk about is this idea of a, of a difference between evolutionary versus revolutionary developments in, in, in any industry. Are there any signs, Leo, right now that we could see revolutionary type developments rather than those evolutionary type developments that you were talking about to, to propel more IPOs? Revolution is, is, is few and far between, Dom, and, and, and I don't see it. The, the one company that continues to fascinate me is obviously Apple. I, I've said to Betty in the past that what fascinates me about Apple is they're, they're in the appliance business, which we thought was, was sort of common and, and it's at its core very competitive. And yet they, they have identified a brand that our children and our grandchildren want over other brands. And, and I'm fascinated by the, uh, uh, by the Google purchase of Motorola mobility because it suggests to me that they think their brand can be put on an appliance as ably as Apple's has. But I, revolution has happened two or three times in my life in this industry. Uh, evolution happens every day. And I, I, I once said to Betty, Dom, that, that uh, under Moore's law, sort of the new Moore's law, it never stops where only I get rich. <laughs> uh, you know, if it did, we'd all be uh, sort of more optimistic about these IPOs. Uh, I'm not optimistic. I'm optimistic about some of the companies, but I'm not optimistic about equity valuations. Someone who's valued a lot of companies with John Malone is Leo Hendry. We've got him here, uh, the founder of Intermedia Partners. And that was Mario Gabelli uh, talking with us a few weeks right. ago about, you know, the future of Yahoo. And, I, you know, I'm just curious. You know all of these people. I, mean, I do. What, yeah. what, do you think, what do you think was a mistake here? Well, the, the, the mistake started with Terry Semmel, and it, and it, and it continued, uh, uh, it certainly started with Jerry Yang, yeah. Terry Semmel, 
and, and even Carol Bartz, uh, Yang and, 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 and uh, Tim Kugel should have done what, what Steve Case did at, at AOL. They had a vanishing asset, highly valued. They should have used it as currency to, to sustain its value. And they never did. They, they just were asleep at the switch. <clears throat> Terry Semmel came in and said, I'll, because he comes from the movie industry, I'm going to make proprietary content. Well, there's right. no such thing. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he was going to have... Not in the day and age of Internet. Yeah, no. not in the day and age. And then, and then Carol came in and said, you know, I'm going to go head to head with, with Google. Well, nobody goes head to head with Google. And, and Mario, who's a, a wonderful shareholder, he, he owned a ton of our stock when John and I were together at TCI and Liberty. Mario is essentially saying what I said in the last segment, that, that Yahoo Japan and Yahoo China actually have barriers to competition. Their, their country rules are such that the things they are doing, other people aren't allowed to do. Are under going to the, be protected. Are going to be protected. Okay. Yahoo, the, the, the parent, <clears throat> is, is a vanishing asset. So Mario's right. Strip out the stuff that is immediately valuable. And, and certainly a, an individual that can do that in his sleep is John Malone. I mean, he's, he's, a, he's the best. Right. And, and, and that would be certainly the tactic I would take if I had that privilege of fixing the company. On the Yahoo uh, uh, detritus, you got to sell it, give it away. Uh, you got to move it over to uh, sell AOL. Sell to who? Well, AOL is, 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 is not hitting it out of the park either. Uh, and, and MSN, you know, might be willing to revisit it just to protect its turf. But it doesn't Some are do saying a private equity player perhaps? Well, private equity, the premise, the, the, the predicate is that they will then sell it at a higher price down the road. It's reminiscent for me of, of the AT&T long distance business. It was worth less today than it was the day before. It's supposed to be the other way around. And so uh, this, this Yahoo.com world or the, the banner ads and, and, and display ads, none of that is unique. None of that. In fact, they've gotten rolled over by a truck called Google, yeah. and and they can't stop. And they it. haven't been able to right grab even right. hold on to their right. market share right. in that. Uh, Leo, in the time that we have, let me talk to you about uh, President Obama right. and his jobs bill, because I do want to get your take. You know, after hearing what he said, uh, are you any more any more um, optimistic that he can help turn this jobs market around? You know, I, I was I was I was hopeful, and then now I'm no, I'm not optimistic. If you look at the bill, it's a 447 billion dollar initiative. Only a third of it, if I really stretch, only a third of it would actually possibly create jobs in the medium term. What's and the then third? It, well, the third is th th there was 50 billion dollars that would go into school repair, okay, so and there and there was a, a modest amount of money for retaining teachers. You know th those I can. So I that's the part you like, right? But the rest of it is is moral. It's ethical. It's palliative. It, it includes extending unemployment benefits. It, it it it's it's sort of these training inducements. They're not going to create jobs. And and what annoys me about the administration and and frankly the Republicans even more so, is that I've got a 20 plus million problem. I have 20 plus million women and men that in real terms <clears throat> are desperately unemployed, about 10 to 13 million of whom for more than a year. Mm -hmm. And if, if I don't see plans that add to millions, I say you're being tepid and, and, and almost rude to the project. And, and again, I, I loved the president's passion the other night. I just don't believe the numbers. I mean, if you're going to get voted down by John Boehner and everything you do anyway, then put your, put your best shot out there and let the American people know that Democrats, progressive Democrats, do have a plan to find those 20 plus million jobs. And Leo, you had at one point, at one point advised President Obama on the economy yes. and about jobs. Uh, and James Carville came out and said, you know what, uh, you know, get rid of, get rid of this economic team. Oh, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd blow them up. You would? Yeah, I, I, and I think they were fault, they can, the fault goes all the way back to June of 09. When Larry Summers, six months in, five months into the new administration, said a job is a job, this trade deficit is manageable, and I'll make it up with the export of legal services, consulting services, and movies. And then fast forward another five months, and he said, oh, by the way, this recession, I declare it over. Mm. And if you're one of those more than 20 million women and men who have been massively unemployed now for length, lengths of time that are unprecedented, you say you're, that you're wrong. You're, you're just dead wrong. And, and I don't see that the economic team, even today, has a sense of the magnitude of the problem and, and the moment of the urgency of it. So who would you, who would you if you had your pick from, from, from anywhere in, the, in, in this country, who would you want then uh, coming in on his team then? 
Oh, they, they, they're, they're, uh, Elizabeth Warren, you should never have let escape you. She's simply remarkable. Uh, you got to listen to the likes of Joe Stiglitz and Paul Krugman and Rob Johnson. I mean, th these are wonderfully gifted women and men who would know how to do it. Uh, you got to listen to the workers themselves. Mr. Obama needs to go to an unemployment line, not to a university in North Carolina the next time. <laughs> All right, Leo. Great to see you, you again. Too, Betty. Always fun. At least it's outspoken. Having you here. Yes, absolutely. Leo Hendry, the managing director at Intermedia Partners.